with that, we are on the cloud. All right, so welcome everyone uh, to this month's Fireside Chat hosted by the Turing Way. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, there it goes. Um, I'm Ann Lee Steele, the community manager of the Turing Way, but I'm really just one of many leaders within this community. And we are so lucky to have a few of you with us uh, this afternoon, evening and morning, calling in from a couple of different time zones. Um, a few words about the Turing Way. It's an open source and open collaborative community uh, developed handbook on data science. And our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science accessible and comprehensible for everyone. And we represent an international community of researchers uh, who create resources as chapters and as community practices, and bringing in perspectives from their countries, from their backgrounds, from their cultures. And so this fireside chat series is really an attempt and an effort to create a shared space where people can gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges, and share different practices that work in different contexts. And so today we're hosting this chat with um, members and leaders of our community and are delighted to feature two projects in particular, Open Vitalists and the Environment uh, Data Science book. You will hear from our speakers and about, about these projects soon. Um, but I'm one of your chairs for this afternoon, along with Malvika Sharon, um, who's the co-lead of the Turing Way. And just as you might have seen in the chat, we do have a shared etherpad uh, to help facilitate written note taking and invite ideas from you all um, who have joined in to listen to us today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we also have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. So if you have really any concerns, you'd like to report any incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call um, or have further ideas to how to improve accessibility um, within our fireside chat more generally, uh, please email us at the turingway at gmail.com. Um, you can also reach out directly to either me or Mojica um, by our private emails on our Slack workspace. Um, information, all of that information is on the pad. And with all of that aside, um, I'm delighted to hand it off to Malvika to kick off today's session. Thank you, Anne. Um, I will just go quickly say that I'm based in London. I would not be introducing uh, our speakers in full detail because we have shared about them in the even right page, but we're not trying to be lazy. We will have an opportunity from each of our speaker to hear about their journey in open science and how they got involved in the Turing way. What, what value does it add into their own project? Um, as Anne said, I'll be co-facilitating this call. So if you see me talking too much, please put it in the chat that we don't wanna hear from you today because I really want to make space for our speakers. So let me start putting a uh, spotlight on all of them. So we have Andrea, we have Patricia, Emma, and let me find Alejandra. All right. Unlike last times, if you have attended any of our Fireside Chat where each of our speakers give pitch about the theme, today we thought we'll do a little bit different. Each of us have been working in open science space for a long time. So we asked each of our speaker to show us what their timeline looks like. Um, and I'm sharing my screen, although we will um, add the link to the slide in the chat. And if you can do that, please. Um, and will be descriptive, uh, so you don't need to worry about if you're just listening in. So I want to start by giving a timeline for the Turing Way. Uh, Turing Way uh, in 2018 received a small funding. Uh, Kirsty Whitaker, who's the project lead and founder, uh, she started the repository on 1st November 2018. So I went back in time to see when the GitHub was set. She was the sole contributor at the time. In 2019, she uh, involved 10 members, one of which is Patricia, you'll hear from her. Um, they ran several workshops, they went around talking about the Turing Way, they ran two book dashes, uh, one of the book dashes was attended by me, and the year ended with 67 contributors. So by December 2019, we had 67 contributors, multiple chapters uh, in the guide for the reproducibility. In 2020, Kirsty received 
funding to expand the project. Um, and that was the entry point for me. I was hired as a community manager. Um, I ran a book dash. We expanded the project into five projects, including collaboration on collaboration, communication, project design, and ethics. And I also started to build community handbook. We ended 2020 with 238 contributors. In 2021, uh, while we were all getting used to working remotely, uh, the project definitely grew quite a lot. We also uh, had lots of social media presence, which means we had lots of Twitter followers. Uh, for a brief period of time, I was using Matomo to guide, um, to, to understand which, which chapters people were visiting, though I'm not allowed to use that anymore. Um, so from that, I can tell you, we had about 3000 monthly visitors of our book. And last year, we also had uh, referencing in government reports and policies. And at the end of, our, of the year, we were um, categorized as highly commended for practices by Hidden Ref. Uh, hopefully, Patricia, Patricia will also mention that. In November, we launched this fireside chat where we discuss what the Turing Way backstory is. So if you do not know about backstory, uh, we will share a link of YouTube video from that fireside chat. And that might really add some completion to this timeline about where we are coming from and where we are heading. One thing to mention uh, that, that even was chaired by uh, Cassandra Gulban Prague. And she asked us, what is Turing Way? And we talked about everything, but not a single time we mentioned that the Turing Way is a book. And she had to say, but you didn't mention it's a book which made me realize that, that the Turing Way is a lot, a lot more to us individually than the book, which is the outcome of the project. So this is the timeline, hopefully just to put in perspective who we are as the project. Um, but I'm going to pass it to Patricia to tell us about her timeline. Thank you, Malvika. Thank you for kicking us off. Um, my name is Patricia Hatterich. I'm currently a research data specialist um, based at the Digital Curation Center at the University of Edinburgh. And um, yeah, this was, was a really interesting um, exercise to reflect about my, my journey in open so far. Um, it started in 2007. That was the year when I started going to university. I um, did a bachelor's and a master's degree in library and information science at the, universe, uh, the Humboldt University in Berlin and was lucky that the um, Humboldt University was quite like forward looking in the way they approached the area of library and information science and they had actually um, quite a lot of content uh, and courses around um, open access publishing, um, research data management and data sharing just started off back there. So I um, actually got in, learned about open science and uh, open already in my studies, which I think is um, quite a lucky position to be in. Uh, while I was doing my master's degree in 2012, I started working at uh, CERN um, and their open access section. So their um, library team has uh, uh, had a section dedicated to um, open access, um, which was working a lot also on open infrastructure and open science things. Um, there I was part of the team that launched a certain open data portal, which was um, openly developed in GitHub and was my first interaction with GitHub. And it was quite a, a like, yeah, jump into the, the cold water at that point because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, but uh, there was an ethos of doing everything in the open and I quite like that. Um, in 2016, um, I was lucky to be invited to the uh, Mozilla Working Open Workshop, which was the kickoff to their um, Mozilla Open Leadership Program and kind of the first iteration of that. Um, and uh, actually, that workshop was quite important to me. I met a lot of great people there. I met Kirsty, the um, lead of the touring um, way and quite a few other people that inspired uh, me along the way. And also their way of working openly was uh, quite different to what I've learned um, 
about openness so far, so being really inclusive and deliberate in um, and how you collaborate was new to me. Um, I then joined like various um, um, universities in, in the UK and I've worked on research data things and promoting open science, but actually didn't get much of an opportunity to work openly in these roles, interestingly. Um, until like Kirsty got the funding for um, this Touring Way project and uh, I managed to um, get invited to be part of the, uh, the core team that got that off the ground. Um, and in 2019, um, then when that happened, I um, yeah, got more into, into communities in general. I was awarded a Software Sustainability Institute fellowship. I uh, joined the wonderful Open Life Science program as a mentor just to um, actually finally give something back from the wonderful Mozilla um, spirit that I um, like got me that that far from 2016 and in, in 2021 i also joined the hidden ref committee um just because um yeah that um i was like kind of frustrated that like in the roles in research support we were quite um quite fundamental to to making research running but uh, often overlooked, uh, so that was just an, uh, another opportunity to um, to promote um, openness and the people that support that um, in a bit more detail. And I was independent of awarding any any prizes in the hidden ref, so uh, it's not down to me that uh, uh, the the touring way got uh, commended there. That's really just down to the wonderful work that this community has been doing. And Thank you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. um, giving a heads up that after we have introductions from everybody, we will have a little bit chance to diagnose or ask questions on these timelines. So if you have any question, folks, please do add that in the chat or in the etherpad. So I'm gonna to move to Emma now. Thanks, Marvika. Um, so, um, so do you want me to introduce my community first, Marvika? Yes, nice? please. Yeah. One of the communities we are featuring is yeah. yours. Please tell us about it. So, so I'm here um, as well as representing the Turing Way. I'm also representing uh, the Open Vitalist community, uh, which was initiated to bring together a global community of vitalist researchers to work on increasing the knowledge of and implementation of open research practices uh, in this discipline. Um, and our community is, is really led by the International Committee on Open Vitalist Science, which I'm the chair of, um, which was created within our International Vitalist Society. Um, so we're working on a number of initiatives, including training in open science practices, um, a FAIR data implementation project called the FAIR Vitalist Project, which is a project that I'm leading, um, and also developing um, open publishing guidelines. Um, one of our really core aims is to be as inclusive as we can in all of our activities that we do. And this really means taking into account the different challenges that face our global research community. Um, one of our focuses is to make our work fully accessible. And we know that one of the biggest barriers is language in our community, um, because we really are a global community. Um, therefore, we're aiming to translate our work into different languages um, to aid understanding and encourage greater participation in our work. Um, and we've already run some GitHub training sessions in English and Spanish, and we're developing um, at the moment a multilingual website, which is what I'm actually spending a lot of my time doing. And thank you to Malvika, because she helped me with that as well. So it, my timeline actually starts in... 20, uh, 2002, I can't even say it because it's so long ago, 2002 to 2006 when I did my PhD. And I have to say, I've always been really interested in methodology. And part of my PhD was to do a replication study, um, which surprisingly I found not to work. Um, and uh, I was very frustrated at that point um, that um, I couldn't get it to work. And it was quite obvious to me that there was uh, this thing called reproducibility that had to kind of happen. At that point, there wasn't really, a, I don't think, a reproducibility crisis because it's so long ago, it's before that, I think. Um, and so when I, I had a bit of a break from academia, I went into teaching, um, which also has its own problems. Um, but um, with 
trying to re-enter academia, I actually worked very independently. And one of the things I did was actually to upskill myself in what was now termed open research. And that was really enabled by a lot of really amazing free and open educational resources that were available online. Um, that hadn't been the case um, when I was doing my PhD. Um, I also started to work with Historic England, who are um, the UK's um, sort of uh, governmental institute that um, oversee archaeological work in, in the UK. So they were very kind to let me um, work with them on a few projects um, and start sort of back in an acad academic way. Um, and then uh, sort of 2019 came and I started really focusing on open science uh, in terms of my discipline and really looking into how it was being applied. Um, and that, um, that, that work and looking online for more resources kind of showed to me that there was this great program called Open Life Science. Um, and um, that's when I met Yo, Amavika and Bernice. And I brought my project into Open Life Science 2 in 2020. And that really spurred me on, on a massive sort of learning curve in open research. And from that program, um, I got, went from being an independent researcher to having a funded research project, um, a fair data implementation project, and then coming into the Turing Way in 2020. So I definitely blame Malvika for that because she asked me if I'd like to come in and do that in a book dash. And then, um, and then really from there, I've um, I've sort of, I suppose, flourished into open, being an open researcher, I suppose, is the end of it. Um, and working with the Turing Way, um, uh, also working for the um, Turing Institute, uh, and I work as a community manager. So this is sort of all my skills that I learned in my grassroots project of the open fight for the community I bring to my role at the Turing uh, in the health programme. And um, also working now as an SSI fellow and with Elixir UK as well as a data stewardship fellow. Thank you, Emma. That's the nicest kind of blame. I'm always happy to take. <laughs> I'm going to ask Alejandro to tell us about his timeline. Okay. Hi, everyone. I, I just want to start as well with the community and represented initiative. This is the Environmental Data Science Book that is a community-driven resource showcasing and supporting the publication of data, research, and open source developments in environmental science. Our goal is to empower environmental researchers and informatics practitioners in general contributing to a collaborative, reproducible, and transparent environmental data science, uh, integrati integra integrating actively with the Turing Way. Uh, we have published uh, numerous uh, Python-based notebooks uh, covering different aspects in, uh, about environmental data science. And as well, we are improving our GitHub repository, but we are expect not just to support uh, Python notebooks, but also R in Julia. And we are growing as a community to try to have uh, co like community calls where we discuss certain aspects about environmental data science. And the, the overall goal is like to try to contribute to improving scientific software practices in the environmental science community. And as I see, this project is more for early entry researchers that are not aware about open source tools and development. So we are trying to encourage these very early, early career researchers to publish their experiments, data, or whatever in this kind of notebooks environment. So that's about the community. And now about my timeline, I would say that uh, my timeline is not that long as, as others. I start to know more about the open science uh, buffet or umbrella recently, but I would like to start uh, when in 2011 and 2014 when I was part of a, a project in my home country as part of uh, the CGR uh, consulting group that one institution is based in Colombia and they were providing open access data of deforestation. So this was, was kind of a contribution that I did for 3 years, generating this data and trying to provide to governments and any kind of a, a, a like researcher this free data about deforestation in Latin America. So it was my kind of first like contribution to open science. Then in, in my master and uh, PhD that I did in, in geography at King's College London, I learned more about data science and AI but thanks to uh, like experiences that have internship in different like institutions, I learned more about how to do version control systems. And I learned more about, about JIT uh, control, like doing in Bitbucket and GitHub, but most of my 
repositories were private. And at the moment, I, I really wasn't aware about the how powerful is you turn your private developments to open. Uh, and I was very bad in documenting and license everything, but <laughs> and then in my in my I started the postdoc at the Turing uh, uh, last year in May 2021. I am I am just to comment. I am co-developing software and tools for environmental monitoring uh, with the British Antarctic Survey, Med Office, Science and Technology Technology Facilities Council, and Cambridge University. And I also contributing to a software for scientific image analysis that is a vision. All, 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 all the developments that I'm now doing uh, are trying to follow the open science uh, like ethos. So we are trying to develop all this software in open source in open man open source software manner. And the most important thing that happened as well in May 2021 was that Kirsty invited me to, to collaborate in the Turing way. And, uh, and the content was too big for me. So I said, I need to help with a small tasks. And that's why I joined to this Spanish translation team because I feel confident with <laughs> speaking with other people about in my, in my language, about what is going on in this content. So that's why I start contributing. And, and to the present, many things happening. Uh, even I am now father, this, this year happened to me. I am my first uh, daughter. Uh, just born two, two months ago. And I co-founded the Environmental Data Science Boot, strongly inspired by the Turing Way and Pangeo, that is another community uh, like promoting open source development uh, for geoscience. I validate this idea in the OLS4. Uh, and I am also part of this of the community. And I also mentor uh, a recent project. So it's a very fascinating community. And I also participated and learned more about open development through the boot dash where the translation team has evolved. And we, uh, with Patul and Andrea and others, we have contributed to create a kind of guidelines. And we are trying to improve the practices and, and how to do translation in the right way with the right technologies. So, so far, these are my, <laughs> uh, my timeline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. You, you definitely started before me, so I don't think you are late in the game. So I'm gonna go to now Andrea. Hi everyone, and thank you for the invite. Um, uh, I, am, I am super happy to, 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 to be here because I am a newcomer to the, I feel like a newcomer to the Turing way, but I will tell you about my, my timeline. Um, uh, my first uh, contact with open science and reproducibility was during my master's and my PhD. I, um, uh, I was a field biologist and a plant ecologist, and um, I was very into open software for analysis. And I used Linux and I was um, trying to do everything uh, with open software. And that's how I started using R in 2009. And, um, and during all my during all this way this time I was trying to do reproducible analysis, but I don't know how this happened because, uh, like Alejandro said, at first all my scripts were private and closed, and I didn't know a lot about um, about uh, sharing them and about the power of sharing these 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 workflows. And we had a collaboration with the National uh, Scientific Computation Lab in Brazil, and. Um, and this was very interdisciplinary and, and it was an opportunity. They were, the first question they asked was maybe, do you use Git? And we were biologists in the field. So it was, it was very new to us. It was like, no, we can analyze data, but we didn't know, we didn't have this culture. So this contact um, and this collaboration between the Rio de Janeiro garden um, the Rio Janeiro Botanical Garden, where I was based, and, and this uh, national lab was very eye-opener eye uh, about how collabor collaboration could happen and uh, how it did happen when, when people did it for seriously. Uh, and um, I started navigating the art communities and, um, and uh, learning more about reproducibility. And in some time between 2017 and 2018, I, I met the R ladies and I joined the R ladies Rio de Janeiro, who, who, is a, who opened the door to, to know lots of people from around the world. 
and to have lots of conversations that were that wouldn't happen if we were only based locally and and this was an eye opener also for international for the importance of international communication and it was also uh, something that made very clear uh, that that made me that made me realize about the, the language barrier because part of this contact also also came with lots of um, efforts to 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 mend language barriers. And this same year, I attended a Kodata School of Research Data Science, um, and it was the first time that I heard about open science beyond reproducibility. And um, and um, it's the first time that I heard about fair data principles and about responsible data science, a little bit of data ethics. And um, it was it was a good way to go beyond open access publishing, which was a little bit what we were uh, taught before when we talked about open science. And and uh, I was already teaching R, but I wasn't teaching this kind of topics. So. Um, when I was in my postdoc in 2019 and 2020, I started teaching R and teaching computational skills to graduate students in Brazil, but including this, this uh, perspective of open science, of collaboration. So we taught version control and, and um, literate programming so people can write also reproducibly. And uh, I've, I found it, it's a two, person initiative, but it's the Independent Biodiversity Informatics Lab. It's, it's, a, it's a, a tiny initiative to, to do courses to, to different groups of people in academic and non-academic settings. And, um, and that's what we were doing. And, and the pandemic opened a lot of, of contacts for us because we were connected via the internet. And, um, one of the things that happened was that we participated in Latin Art 2020. We were one of the first tutorials in Portuguese and Latin Art is, a, is an amazing community based in Latin America that is trilingual by, by design. They wanted to include everybody in South America and Latin America. So they use English, they use Portuguese and Spanish as languages, as official languages. So that the fact that I was Colombian, I am Colombian and that I was in Brazil, um, helped me navigate a lot, but also understand that that the language barriers still, it was still a thing, it was still a, 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 a topic. <clears throat> so when during the when du during the pandemic, I also had um, the opportunity to, I was invited because of my participation in the art communities, I was invited to be part of the Use Art 2021 organization team, and uh, I was the diversity and accessibility and inclusion team lead. And this was mind blowing for me because it taught me about, uh, about multi how to build a multilingual conference and, and how to work across, uh, across countries with a multilingual community, multilingual team uh, in different time zones. And, and I learned about captions and accessibility. I am still learning. And uh, this is an amazing team that gathered uh, a knowledge base and published um, a manuscript about how to host an inclusive conference that includes the language barrier, but not only this. We talk about uh, accessibility, about unpaid work and, uh, and uh, other features that happen in conferences and how, how to create a culture of, of more inclusive conferences. I, Batul and Liz are here in the call and they are co-authors of this manuscript. It's going to be published soon. And it's one of the, the most eye openers things that happened recently to me. Um, and in this wave of connecting uh, during the pandemic, I heard about the Turing Way. Uh, and, I, and I participated in the November Book Dash. And um, as Alejandro said, I, I, I feel like I am still a learner. I was just navigating the content and people were so confident of doing uh, pull requests and, and say, hey, I have this idea, I have this idea. I, and I, I, my way to navigate this was, let's find a place where I can help while I, while I study, while I read, while I see the community. So uh, I saw that Batul and Alejandro were already starting to think about the translations. And I said, this is a good place. And I started, I joined the team and uh, we are trying to 
um, make it a sustainable work uh, so that the translation is very well documented for more people to get on board, even if, even if there is a turnover in, in the community. And, um, and um, to create, it, it's kind of a, like a parallel community also, because there are, these are people who come from other countries, who come from other backgrounds, and that would like to have this content in their language. Uh, but you don't need, you shouldn't be needing speaking English fluently. This, uh, this, the fact that you are not an English speaker native it shouldn't be a barrier. So we are trying to do this community, this community to build this community. And this is how I got here. <laughs> Thank you. Malika, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Should, should know, right, how to speak. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I am going to skip timeline for Anne and me and move on to the next part. But first of all, I want you to want to thank everybody for sharing that timeline because it just generates a lot more question for me. But it also hopefully allows others to see that, that the Turing way is just part of everybody's journey. There's no enter and get trapped or enter. And this is all you do is just a segue. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Anne to lead us to the next part. Great. Um, yeah, just echoing Malvika. It's so, I mean, it's amazing to see how deeply personal, but also how different everyone's experiences and journeys have been within Open, and definitely how they're not even close to being done. Um, I wonder what that timeline would look like in another year or two years or five more years down the line. Um, I guess to get us started, uh, I'll begin with this question for Patricia. Um, you are a founding member of the Turing Way. Um, you were the first community manager, actually, of the project, um, who was involved when really this, what has become such a massive book, was really just a blank page. Um, it, even though you all had a vision for really what it could become. Um, and so I was wondering, what were you, what was going through your mind in that moment? Um, what were you all thinking? It's, it's interesting that like Malvika uh, in her introduction said that like we tend to forget about the book and like thinking back to that initial period, I think it was more about the conversations than there actually being like a book being produced. Um, and like Kirsty was very clear that this is going to be like you know, just a starting point for a community for people contributing. Um, and in the conversations, like it, it was interesting. I mentioned that the, like, you know, the, the book is built on that, um, um, on the principles of Mozilla Open Leadership. And I think in the initial uh, team that Kirsty brought together, it actually was a good mix of people that had gone through the Mozilla Open Leadership training and were like familiar with that were kind of understanding that you know this is where this could lead and um, how contributions could come in and then people that basically have been very good with the um, technical aspect but actually haven't really worked openly yet so it was really interesting from the start that the key point was those conversations about getting people the people to work there to work openly to get that content out there and um, that took a while so I actually like a lot of it was just conversations are sitting in a room yes there were post-its that we tried to get an initial book structure together and decide which chapters would be uh, would get written but it actually was much more than that it was like having those conversations about putting a first version out trying to figure out what a, a workflow would look like for others to contribute and just really getting into that spirit and embracing the fact that like yes we're gonna produce a first draft of a chapter and at some point it was helpful that we decided we would launch at the collaborations workshop in 2019 because that gave us a very clear deadline when we wanted to have something to, to show to people. Um, 
but it really was more about like em embracing the fact that like whatever we are missing out in our first draft of that chapter is just uh, an opportunity for someone to to come in and say like I think you're missing this section I'm gonna write it for you um, and that that took off the pressure of like whatever content you you will be producing it doesn't have to be perfect yes you want it to be like you know solid and somehow coherent um, but it's it's not like you're writing a research paper and reviewer two is coming in and taking you apart. This is gonna be like really in a in a very different spirit. And um, yeah, I think what stuck is really that like those conversations, trying to get those people that haven't worked uh, openly on the team to get confident in like just sharing early, you know, and uh, exploring the workflow. Um, and then from that, um, we we created the first like book dashes to bring more people in. And um, yeah, I think it's it's more the conversations. I have like no idea what the, you know, I wrote one of some of the initial chapters. I have no idea any longer what they looked like, if they were any good. And people have like come in and actually like built, like introduced their own thing and uh, and just taking that to, to a level that I could not have dreamt of. I think that's also looking at the book now and looking like how, how limited our thinking actually was in like, this is like a guide on reproducibility. And these are like, was just looking at some of the chapters that we thought like in a dream world, they could be added and just what has like, um, you know, what has become of it. It's, it's, beyond I think what anyone could have imagined in those really early meetings so it's it's really exciting to to be here and and reflect back but yeah I think it's more keep it as really it was always about the the community and give actually just giving people the skills and the confidence and you know content is secondary and it's great that there's like now a lot of good content in there but uh, I think just from the get-go that it was not about the book, which helped. I wonder if, uh, I wonder how um, Andrea, for example, you would think of as the, this kind of barriers for entry into, or that a different version of the, the fear of the blank page, where did you feel that similarly, that it wasn't that, what was the process of um, creating, I guess, what would be Call, kind of called a critical mass uh, for getting involved in uh, a, a similar sort of community. I, I think we're all, we come, we all come from our, we, with our personalities. So it depends a lot on how you deal with these kind of atmospheres. There are people who are super engaging, they're extroverted, people who are go going to be diving into, into, into the community and ask away and, and my, my, my experience is not that one. I am just a, a person who enters slowly and starts observing. Um, and I, I, I think the, the entry point, I would absolutely uh, do not recommend entering shyly, like you can ask away, of course, but, uh, but for people who do not speak English as, as their first language, it's an additional barrier sometimes. And, um, and documentation is key, like key documentation that makes very clear that we are welcome and maybe repeats it a couple of times more. Like this is seriously, you're definitely welcome. And, and uh, having, having um, different entry points. And this is something that we are trying to do with the, with, the, with, the, with the translation team. Like you don't have to be part of the community already. You don't have to, uh, we have the tech part solving the fact that you don't need to be super fluent in English. We have a team that and, and channels of communication that should be any any one of us uh, should be able to 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 answer doubts um, in different languages because there's Alejandro, there's Vato, and we we are a multilingual team. And um, and the idea also is that we have um, teams that maybe 
what I would like what I would like to think is that this translation is a way to appropriate the the, the information to appropriate the community, and maybe there's a moment where 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 um, we're engaging with the main content is natural. So the so so you get to know the dynamics. I think this should be natural. I, but it depends a lot on on how on on how the personality of everyone and i think everybody should should fit like not only the extroverted people who go and 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 ask should be should be able to to join and definitely this is something that we're working on yeah it feels like there's this i know time is really just zooming by um but it really, I, I can sense a, in many ways a tension between both of uh, what you said in the sense that on one hand to build the book, it wasn't necessarily about the process of creating the guides, but rather the process of creating the community together. But once the guide has been formed or a version of it in process, that documentation process is actually also really important in order to enable people to feel that that they're able to join the community, whether that's in the form of the language that they feel most comfortable with um, and other kind of allowing for other types of entry points as well. That's really, really interesting. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to move on to another question. It very much leads into actually the, the, the next topic that we are interested in exploring together, which was, um, Emma, I'm gonna point this one uh, in your direction where we know you've been involved in many different projects, but You've also talked a bit about the barriers um, that you've experienced in one going back and forth between the world of academia and back into, and leaving it and returning back to research. Um, also barriers faced when you've been leading your project, the open fight list, and kind of maintaining all of these different roles in these different spaces. And we're wondering, you know, what barriers did you face, but also what support um, did you need? And, uh, in order to kind of overcome these barriers? Um, so, yeah, so I do currently hold two very different roles, which I find really exciting. Um, but someone said to me recently, how do I change from archaeology to health? Like, and how do I just do it in a minute? Because I do work very flexibly. So in one minute, I'll be looking at, I don't know, it, electronic health data and the next minute I'm talking about indigenous data with someone from historic England or something like that so I switch from one to the other and I've just become very used to that but I think what it kind of boils down to is that both of the roles and this is also my role within the Turing way is really based in um, open research and these you know what what Kirsty has called her program tools practices and systems I mean that's what I do every day in both roles and um, that's really what I think helps me to contribute to the Turing Way and be part of the Turing Way. And I find, like, I came to the Turing Way as a volunteer. And for me, it was an amazing, or it is still, you know, will always be, I think, an amazing community that is supportive of anyone who is coming into and wanting to learn about or who is experienced in uh, open research. It's it's the whole spectrum, really. And so um, that that allows me to actually um, be creative in, in the way that I um, do different things within the Turing Way community, like write chapters or things like that. But I actually find so much crossover between my two roles that I often can't believe it, actually. <laughs> and um, so, like, um, at the moment, I'm working a lot uh, in the Turing Way about uh, writing chapters for sensitive data. So hopefully those will be in there very soon when I get around to it. But those are issues that I'm dealing with um, in both both jobs. It's things that we're having conversations about all of the time, all of the time, and it's because those are new things and new challenges that actually all open researchers are having to deal with at the moment to make things happen. And actually, that's what's exciting is to bring those um, new um, new new problems and any solutions that we've come up with. Because it might be one solution, but when you start to talk to other people in the Turing way. They've done it in a mul you know, multiple other ways as well, which I think is what's really exciting about open research at the moment is that, you know, everyone is pushing at the forefront of this movement. And actually we are we are part of that. And that, you know, that makes our research in any discipline really, really exciting, I think, at the moment. And it's those sorts of things that I think we're bringing, we're all bringing into the Turing way to sort of highlight all of those different things that are going on in 
all different communities all of you know globally really so we're such a global community um and so i think i think that's it i mean the cheering way makes it really easy for me to contribute <laughs> so yeah Oh man, I'm gonna have to, I feel like it leads really easily actually into, I'll, I'll pass to Movika in a second because of the way in which uh, Alejandro, your project brings in domain specific ideas, but you're also um, with the environmental data science book as well as um, the Turing way being a kind of collection of meta practices. Um, but I'll leave it to Movika maybe to ask that question. Yeah, I, we we definitely we, we were very ambitious we, when we thought this conversation can happen in one hour, no problem. But we obviously could have had this conversation much longer. So Alejandro, really just to that question that we always hope that you know someone will take all these things that we're writing uh, and, and all these practices we are capturing community handbook and use it. Like that that's as Patricia was saying, we just dream of things and someone comes in and actually does that. And you did that. You took some of these practices and you built a project that's uniquely yours. You contextualize the best practices from the Turing way in environment and environmental data science book, which is a very, very successful book, in my opinion. So can you share how, how that process looked like for you? Because you mentioned entering, not knowing what to do, and then suddenly you, you basically extrapolated that. OK, yeah. Thank you, thank you for the invite. I, I mean, like when I start uh, like reading about the Turing Way, I, for me it was overwhelming to see many content like saying, "Wow, where I start looking what to read." But thanks to this joining to the translation, to Spanish the Spanish translation team, I learned more about the Turing Way and I start just seeing some concepts like I start saying, oh, "Okay, why we are not applying these concepts in environmental science, in particular in my project." where I'm collaborating with people with different institutions and they are creating tools and so on. So I found, okay, it's not just uh, the technology that they mentioned in the book, but as well the community they are, they are creating at the Turing way, feeling part of a community. So I started experimenting, experimenting with my, the researches of my project to create this kind of, okay, I will try to create the infrastructure that you probably you publish, not both of what you're doing, but I also would like to start organizing like I kind of project calls like more for early career scientists on my project to meet together and discuss what you're doing and so on. So tends to see that the Turing way, it was successfully running these collaboration cafes and co-working space. I, I start basically saying, okay, I can replicate this to my project, but then with my manager, uh, Scott Hoskin, uh, he, we thought it's, it's good to extrapolate, not just being our internal project, it's good to look more for external people who are having the same barriers. So environmental scientists, sometimes uh, the community that know about open source for me is like small and we need to, in order to make a huge impact, we need, we need to communicate better about open science to the other percentage that are not aware about how powerful is this. So that's why we're thinking to create this idea where community, more community driven resource where people can collaborate. Uh, we put in practice like many things that, uh, that, that are mentioned there, like, uh, like being citable, you know, like reproducible. So we start looking to perfectionating these notebooks in order to bring these ideas there. And uh, as, you, as you write, we, I don't feel that is 100% successful yet because it, it's a lot of maintenance that unfortunately, I am trying to, for instance, have help from the community that I am in Pangeo Europe. I am collaborating with Anne for you, that is here. She is a research software engineer at the Oslo University. And we are like trying to improve the, the infrastructure of publication of, of notebooks in an automated manner using continuous integration and development. That I also, thanks to the uh, Turing Way members like Sarah Gibson, she has been very helpful for me and, and she's very kind to help me sometimes guiding me with resources and so on. So it's something that I see potential when I, using the Turing way is not only the, the handbook, it's also to, to ask to the community that is there, the different experts to help. Uh, you, you have any problem I, that I see in the other way and the different channels that we have in Slack, people asking to validate ideas. And something very important to mention is that the Turing Way connected me with the other program, like Open Life Science Program, that definitely was a super powerful training program where I validate 
uh, the environmental data science book and so on. And they're also saying about the maintenance. So it's, I guess it's something that I'm struggling with the project sometimes, but at the moment I am collaborating as well with uh, two PhD enrichment students at the Turing who are in somehow volunteering and help me to improve the, the notebook. It's not only me, but also trying to reach other people and they learn about open science and they are also environmental scientists. So they are also learning about open science resources, open software and so on. So I try just to uh, like trying to share my knowledge to others and I am not the solo maintainer of my stuff. I see there is a huge potential as well to extrapolate what I'm trying to innovate in my project in, in, in bigger communities so, or so on. So as my key message is like, I see many content in the Turing way, but find th that content that you are more passionate and try to, to try to create a crazy idea and translate that something that is tangible and that benefit the open science community and the Turing way in general, and you can validate through the different members that are part of the Turing way community. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alejandro. And that actually leads me directly to Andrea, um, which was Andrea and I had lots of discussion around the process is so important. The process of doing is so important, which, which is where I'm gonna pose this question to you, Andrea. Out of all the things you could do, why translation in the Turing way? I think I already gave lots of points about this because of the experience in Brazil versus Colombia and the getting to know the Our Ladies and the Latin R. And, um, and, uh, and while teaching, while teaching uh, grad students in Brazil and not only them, um, lots, of, lots of things that we do is creating material in, in the original, in, in the language. So I, I have been translating material to Portuguese and to Spanish a lot. So it, it, it's something that seems like a, like a, like a, like a, like a one-time task, but actually lots of researchers around the world are permanently translating their materials and, and, and using this language to other languages. They're coming back and forth. And um, for me, it was it was natural, and and I believe that translation at the end be becomes the starting point for more community building and to get people. Because what Alejandro was saying that it's about the people uh, when you translate and when and when you cross this very it's even more. You can feel this even more. And and uh, I I would like to it it was it it is going to be, I I think it's a way to to start other conversations in other places. And maybe this can come back to, to the main content because the current view is still uh, English centric and, and, and there's a lot of practice around, but I, I am eager to, to know, to, to, to see how the processing in other languages in other communities also comes back with new content who was originally written in other languages, for example, who was processed in other ways and, and, and it, it uh, it comes and fits the whole the whole the whole book. So uh, for me, it was it was uh, natural, and uh, and uh, I think uh, I, we have we have teams that only speak in their own languages. I I would like to shout out to the Turkish team and to and to because they are having conversations. They are having conversations about the content that we do not get, but, and, and, and they are super active and, and they are documenting the, the translation process. Uh, so, it, it, and I think it's also a way to, to acknowledge some invisible work that happens a lot around the world. That is this translation and localization is something that we all have to do all the time. So, so, so make it a, 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 a community, part of the community and acknowledging this is also important. Yeah, I, and I, I remember you talking about the, the importance of democratizing by letting people own the knowledge as in they, as they translate. Can you comment on that? And also there's a question, maybe if you can add a couple of answers to that. How do you keep this work sustainable in, when, you're, when things are getting constantly updated in the project? Um, I'll... I'll uh... I'll start with the last part. We are adding a little bit of friction to the process. We, are, we, are, we have to keep it updated. So with Batul and with Alejandro, we have talked a lot about, uh, we know that the translations are going to be a little bit late, but, but uh, uh, we still need to make 
automatic pulls constantly or we will be too late. And the first uh, translation initiative for Spanish branched from a version and suddenly there were like 200 commits uh, behind. So, so now, but we'll solve this with automatic pulls, but still the process is going to be slower than, so we know that it's going to be a little bit slower, even if we keep the pace of the, of the, of the automatic, uh, by doing automatic pulls. Um, and the sustainability comes via documentation. Documentation is life and documentation and, and, and governance is life. So people in the team leads in each language should be able to, to decide what to do with their own uh, languages. And we have some priorities like the welcoming pages, some landing pages, but also the interest of the people, the demand for, for every team it can change. So this is part of the, of the process. Like every, every team lead in the, in the languages should be able to, to take. And uh, about democratization, I, I think it's part of education, and I think it's part of communication between 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 uh, between the um, between researchers. Like we, we have to take away the center for some for some practices. Even open science has this center and this and this margin that 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 needs to be taken into account. So so um, translation, but not only translation, is part of this. Thank you so much. And that is the end of the call. This is why we had probably gone back to one hour 30. I would love to keep talking to you all, but folks, if you're here, you can always come and join us in Collaboration Cafe because we, we always have these kind of conversation. I'm gonna pass it to Anne to close us, um, but thanks all for joining us. Thank you all. I feel like there are so many threads uh, to pick up, up on from everyone. Um, but I think to, to close, um, we really just wanted to ask you all very quickly, um, you know, if you could take a minute to share some, I guess, like tricks or tips or recommendations for people that are just getting started um, to navigate both the world of open science and open scholarship, but the Turing way as well. Um, and maybe we'll start in the same order that we began, beginning with one of our OG members, Patricia, and then on to um, then Alejandro, Emma, and then Andrea. Oh, that's a tough one to close out because um, their top tip, I think, a lot, yeah, a, a lot is like Andrea said, like you, you watch, like you, you, you're you shy and you watch people. So if you're shy and you watch people, I think find, find a buddy, I think, if you, if you can, someone who basically cheers you on along the way, because in the end, there's not, you know, there's, there's no right or wrong. Uh, it, it's just like whatever works for you. And I think finding someone who, tells you that while you're going on this journey is like a, it's probably the best thing um that you can happen and uh in in this in the touring way community and some of the other communities that have been mentioned that, um there should be people that that can do that for you so um like get, get yourself a cheerleader i think is my top tip Well, well, just in my in my case, I would say something that you are uh, passionate and curious. If you like data, just type data. If you like software, type software. Whatever you are curious about, you will find something in the Turing way because really it's like <laughs> many things happening there. And as well, maybe something that you, I'm mentioning here, but there is a project about personas that is about, I don't know when is that coming at some point, but that's going to facilitate a lot to navigate into the Turing way. If you are more like high level or you are a student, whatever, that's gonna help a lot in the future. So yeah, just that. Um, so I would just say you need to find the community that suits you, that you are really enthusiastic about. So that might be the cheering way, come along because we'd love you to join us, but it could be any community. So like a domain specific one, you know, and you will learn so much from just meeting people and networking and, by you know joining their slack space and seeing what events are on so i think just join an open community um, that that you'll enjoy
And, and mine would be trust the documentation when it says you're welcome and don't let don't let yourself be intimidated by the amazing appearance of maturity of the Turing way because it looks very mature, it looks very complete, it looks very cohesive, but there are so many ways to collaborate. You can review, you can write, you can contribute, and there's so so many ways that you can don't 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 feel it's uh, don't work. You definitely anyone could contribute and take things and and come back with with ideas. Beautiful. Oh, well, thank you all so, so much for joining us. Um, very early morning for you, Andrea, I know, um, and afternoon and evening um, here in the UK. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I know we're a couple of minutes over time, but actually a suggestion that was given us to us um, a couple of months ago at another fireside chat was to leave this space open, the Zoom room open for anyone that wants to stay, that wants to chat, you're totally welcome to stay. This room will stay open if you'd like. Speakers, please feel no pressure to stay, um, but we wanna make sure that there are open spaces where people can hang out as they like. So thanks again for joining us. Um,